of basketball. I remember being a kid and disappearing to the gym after school until late in the night. And my passion for basketball is what brought me here to Hamlin, where I spent my freshman year on the bench. You can laugh at that. <laughs> and that summer, I vowed I would do anything in my power to see time on the court my sophomore year. And I did. At 19, life was good. I was in school and living out my dreams as a college athlete. I remember the day of my first game so vividly. There's this thrill that runs through your entire body, and you're constantly bouncing back and forth between total excitement and complete terror. And as I'm driving to my first game of the season, listening to my favorite music, running through the plays in my head, smack! I come to my senses, and the throbbing pain in my head is excruciating. I had been in a car accident and was left with a traumatic brain injury, a severe one, one that took me out of school and ended my basketball career. I was devastated. The following year was full of intense rehabilitation therapy debilitating headaches, depression, troubles with learning, vision, processing, a lot of failures, and a lot of questions of what's next. I finally returned to school and started working as a nursing assistant. I met some incredible people during this time who in the midst of pain, illness, and loss, welcomed me into their homes like family and shared their world with me. One day, a nurse came to visit the home of the patient I was caring for at the time. And during her visit, the nurse looked at my patient and she said, if you don't change your lifestyle, you will not be able to live at home anymore. You are too sick. And after the nurse left, my patient with tears in her eyes looked at me and said, I don't know where to begin. And I didn't either. I, too, was struggling with my health and honestly had just begun to accept that life was going to be more of a challenge. I felt hopeless. You see, my time after the accident showed me how disconnected we all are, myself included, from the things beyond our standard medical system that impact our health. Food, exercise, environment, relationships, stress, I could go on. And from where I was standing, optimal health was at the top of a very tall mountain. And I felt so small. In my quest for wholeness, I went back to the genesis of good health the very food we eat. I enrolled in Cornell University's plant-based nutrition program and soon found out this was my new passion and purpose. It may sound crazy, but plants have changed my life. They've completely improved my health and they're changing the world too. To understand my passion a little better, I wanna take us all on a journey to where our food is cultivated, the farm. The first story I want to share with you is about a group of farmers in Montana whose community relies upon agriculture to survive. They rely upon the farms and the farmers to grow crops, hire people, and provide food to the community and the rest of the nation. Several years ago, this farming community ran into some challenges. They started realizing their soil wasn't healthy, and as a result, their harvests were diminishing. They were needing more water to keep their plants alive. Weeds became incredibly difficult to manage. The use of fertilizer started to increase, and the lakes and streams surrounding this community became polluted with farm runoff. The second story I want to share with you is about a community in Honduras. Very similar situation. A town dependent on the farms and the farmers to provide food, jobs, sustenance, they, too, ran into the same challenges. Their soil wasn't healthy. 
their food sources were decreasing. In addition, this community started experiencing devastating land erosion, poverty, and the rates of malnutrition rose significantly. Now what moved me most about both of these stories is that both of these communities were able to completely turn their reality around in a relatively short period of time. What was responsible for this miraculous recovery? Peas. They added peas into the rotation of their crops. The power of plants and their ability to heal our environment heal our bodies and feed an ever-growing population is the reason I stand here in front of you today. I have a very strong belief. Some of you may think I'm crazy. I believe peas will save the planet. You may laugh now, but you're going to be crazy with me at the end. <laughs> and I want to show you how. But first, I want everyone to think about something they've had to eat in the last 24 hours. Chances are, whatever you ate, at some point along its journey, started in the soil. That's where all of this starts, the soil. It's where we grow our food, but it also houses trees that help us breathe. Nearly everything we do starts in the soil. In reality, it was more likely that whatever you ate was grown in unhealthy soil. It was cultivated in an environment that could not support it. The soil that is sustaining life today isn't healthy. In fact, every minute we are losing one-fifth of a mile of healthy soil. That means by the end of this talk, in the next 13 minutes, we'll have lost nearly 24 square miles of healthy soil. This rapid decline in soil health is occurring at a rate 100 times faster than it would naturally. Why? Intense farming practices are disturbing the organic soil matter which house these little bacteria called microbes. What are microbes? Microbes are what give our food and our food's food nutrients to grow into healthy and strong plants. I want to show you a little demo. Let's take a look at these two containers of soil. They look relatively the same, right? This teaspoon of soil contains healthy organic matter with about 10 billion microbes in a single teaspoon. There are 10 billion microbes in this teaspoon of soil. This is ideal soil. This other teaspoon has been degraded to around 50%, about half of its natural healthy state, due to intense farming practices which have unfortunately become the norm these days. This is our reality. Expectation, reality. Is 50% a big deal? Let's put it this way. With a deficit of active microbes, it gets really, really hard to grow food for us and for our livestock. So how do we grow food when our soil isn't healthy? Well, unfortunately, we've turned to added fertilizers and other intense farming practices, which work well until they wash into our waterways, completely degrade our soil, or make our crops more susceptible to disease, drought, illnesses. In the last 12 years, we have spent $51 billion to boost our food's growing production due to unhealthy soil and lack of proper microbes. And the consequences of unhealthy soil are seen well beyond the farm. We see them in our waterways and eventually in our oceans where they take the form of dead zones. Unhealthy soil contributes to dangerous land erosion, unpredictable flooding, farmers increasingly reliant on herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, and a whole heck of a lot more. There are some changes that we can make now, however, 
that will have drastic impacts on our future. And the first thing we have to do is get down and dirty with the way we are treating our soil. Before we dive in, though, let's talk about some indisputable facts. Everything needs nitrogen to grow, including that food you ate. And when there's not a natural abundance of nitrogen to grow our food, we have to add it back through fertilizer. Global use of nitrogen fertilizer is by far the largest. In 2018 alone, there were nearly 118 million tons of nitrogen added to plants. You may be looking at me thinking like, why is this a big deal? Google dead zones. It's just one of the many consequences of dumping nitrogen on the land. Now here's another indisputable fact. And this is an exciting one. Peas create their own fertilizer. They promote a process called nitrogen fixation. They're one of the only plants in the world who's able to do this. The pea plant takes carbon from the air and converts it into a sugar. The sugar then travels through the plant, out through the roots, and into the soil where it feeds the microbes. I'll say that again because that's like kind of a lot. Carbon from the air into sugar. Through the plants, out through the roots, feeds the microbes. The microbes then use the sugar to convert gaseous nitrogen from the air and the soil into a usable form of nitrogen for the plant. This process doesn't only make the peas healthier, it makes the microbes healthier, and nitrogen naturally placed in the soil without the need for added fertilizer. Guess what happens to something that's planted after a pea? Well, the soil is healthier, so the crops produce larger, healthier yields, and the need for added nitrogen fertilizer is almost always eliminated. Using peas to heal the landscape put it back in balance. That's what those farmers in Honduras and Montana and endless other communities have been able to do. But what does this all mean to us? Well, let's go back to that meal you ate. Everything we eat, whether I like to accept it or not, impacts our bodies and the environment beyond measures we can even begin to comprehend. Let's consider something very, very important and often misunderstood. Where you get your protein from in the food you eat. There's this widespread belief that protein comes only from animals. And I promise this isn't the part of the talk where the crazy vegan chick tries to convince everybody in the world to become <laughs> vegan. I promise there's no scary videos, okay, we're all good. I'm not advertising veganism. Get this though. Proteins consist of 20 different amino acids, 11 of which can be synthesized naturally by our bodies. The remaining nine, what we call essential amino acids, must be ingested from the foods we eat. So technically, when it comes to what we consume, our bodies require certain amino acids, not protein, one could argue. Either way, these nine essential amino acids are not exclusive to an animals. In fact, they're originally synthesized by plants and found in meat and dairy products only because those animals ate plants. Peas, in particular, are incredibly powerful. They're considered both a protein and a vegetable and contain all nine essential amino acids. And if just one time in the next year, you were to swap out meat for a meal and swap in peas, that decision would be the environmental equivalent of taking your car off the road for 320 miles. Just one meal in the next year. Imagine your impact if you did that one time a month or one time a week for the next year. Not to mention consumption of peas is linked to a healthy gut, heart, and brain responsible for lowering cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, anti-inflammatory diseases, and chances of stomach cancer while promoting health in newborn babies. More importantly, peas are considered one of the most affordable and nutritious sources of protein on the planet. The cost of one gram of protein from meat is four times more than one gram of protein from peas. 
you may be looking at me or sitting there talking to your friends thinking, this pea chick is wild. <laughs> and I am, I have to admit. But my friends, peas do not look like the kind of peas your parents used to push in front of you as a kid. After this talk, check out your local grocery store. You will find burgers, milk, cheese, butter, flour, all made from peas. And it tastes amazing. This is all food that has been made from a pea. Pea fiber, pea starch, pea flour, pea protein, and just peas in general. It's amazing. You might even start to see biodegradable cups, silverware, plates, bags made from pea starch. I have a theory that if we take care of the environment, the people on this earth, making sure they have access to healthy, safe, affordable food, and caring for those little critters we're walking this earth with, we have a pretty good chance of saving our planet. If we want to heal this earth, we have to start somewhere, right? In Himalayan philosophy, there's this concept of the guru. And the guru is the teacher. It's this idea that everything you meet in life is your teacher. You know, throughout this recovery process, it's been, and really just in life in general, it's been really easy to see a huge mountain in front of me and feel so, so small. But it has always been the little things that have pushed me to heights I never knew I could reach and helped my patients live happier, healthier, fuller lives. The next time you start to feel small, I sincerely, sincerely hope you remember the P and how this little, little thing is changing the world. The P is the teacher, the guru. It reminds us no matter how small, we are all able to make a tremendous difference. Go conquer that mountain and fuel your body with peas. Thank you. <laughs>